back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I wanted to talk about this email I got from Reverb. Unfortunately, they had a little bit of a data breach, and just in case you didn't get this email, I wanted to make sure that, you know, everybody goes and changes their Reverb password. Even though they're saying that they have no reason to believe that any of this information was ever misused, nor do they believe that any passwords or payment information was compromised, it's, you know, still a good idea to change your passwords every once in a while. Because data breaches from websites happen all the time and you rarely ever get notified about it. So that sketchy website that you ordered like a swimsuit off of or something five years ago, say their data gets taken, they see your password there, they'll try it on all these other locations and it just might be a fit. That's another good reason why you don't use the same password for absolutely everything. But if you're curious as to the information that was publicly accessible for some time, there was contact information including your full name, address, and phone phone number and your email. And someone actually forwarded me the uh, whistleblower on this one, I guess you could call him Vladimir here, is the one that discovered this leak. Apparently all this information was on an unprotected Elasticsearch server that he found. And on top of what Reverb said was compromised, he's saying also they had access to your PayPal email address if it was any different, as well as listing and order information. You can read through this article, but essentially this is what was available on somebody. They could. And you might think, ah, it's not that big of a deal. At least they don't have like payment information. And yes, this probably could have been a lot worse. And even though at this time they don't believe this data fell into the wrong hands since this guy, he alerted Reverb and they're making it better, but he's saying to watch out for targeted phishing attacks. So for example, you're in your email, if you get something from Reverb, you click on it, it looks pretty legit. Make sure up here it actually says info at reverb.com because if somebody sends you this and it looks pretty good and you go to click on it and it says hey log into your reverb account they now have your email they have your name they have things that can make that email look more legitimate so if you sign in to reverb on this fake page they now have your access information into there so that is pretty much the extent of what could happen if somebody nefarious did get a hold of this information before it was found out I've got no way to know if this is directly related, but while editing this, I actually received an unknown name phone call, followed up by a fake phishing PayPal email. Now granted, I get at least five of those a week. So I guess that's another thing you should watch out for, are people calling and claiming that they're from Reverb and they need your password or something. So my best advice for you guys is uh, make sure it's actually from Reverb. Make sure it's not a suspicious email. It's something you're expecting, you know, somebody messaging you on Reverb about an item you're actually selling. And if the email has anything about urgency, you must log in within 24 hours or your account will be shut down. Something, you know, silly like that. Reverb would not send that to you. It stinks that it happened, but at least Reverb let us know about it. So that's the end of today's PSA. Let's see what kind of guitars we can talk about today. Oh, this one reminds me right here. This 52 tribute on Instagram today. Jared got one of my dream guitars in less than dreamy condition, but one of those guitars I want to review nonetheless. So basically the story behind this Les Paul that he was just gifted is it was in one of the biggest tornadoes ever. I think it was from 2013, yeah, late November. And essentially the tornado just destroyed this guitar and they just found the body of this thing laying in the yard. You can read the full story here, but essentially the guy was given that and then he gave it to Jared because Jared is now going to have another person restore this back to, you know, slightly original. But he was saying that he's not actually going to refinish any of this stuff. And I think that's a fantastic move because there's such a story behind this, you know, in this crazy tornado gets its neck ripped off and apparently they're just going to put a new neck on it. That is going to be a cool guitar, and it brings, you know, fourth mention of the original Les Paul Gold Tops. Because you're going to notice here, huh, what's with that pickup? The very first ones had unbound fretboards and these diagonal screw bridge P90s. And I've always wanted to document one of those because it was one of the firsts. And I just happened to like the quirky nature and aspect of the sideways diagonal screws. Normally a P90 has two screws in the middle. You can kind of see them right here. 
as of right now, there's actually three of them on the market. They all want like $35,000, $40,000, which is, it's just way too much. But maybe, maybe the right guy would pay that. I'd be happy at like 20000 This is what it would have originally looked like. I'll be interested to see. Does Jared go for a full restoration as far as like the trapeze tailpiece? Or does he convert it to a wrap tail or a tunematic? Because I feel like he respects the heritage of the instrument, but at the same time, it's kind of player's grade. He's going to want it to be the best it can be. That's going to be a moral dilemma, but hey, at least he can fix the neck angle now. <laughs> but he's already given it the perfect name. Dorothy, you know, for obvious Wizard of Oz reasons. But continuing on here, ooh, looks like we might have a deal I have to buy. Gibson Melody Maker 2007. Somebody's thrown some humbuckers in here. It was either aged or played a lot. I guess it depends what humbuckers they put in. All right, does it have a headstock repair? Ah, they're Epiphone pickups. But ooh, slash humbuckers? I feel like somebody was looking for one of these things. That might have been a different guitar, but you can only get these in the Slash Signature guitars. So the fact that there's a loose pair, I mean, if you want one of these, that, that's like one of your only options to get it. Now, I remember what it was. Somebody was looking for the pickups out of the Jimmy Page Telecaster, the USA one, because he wanted to put it in his uh, Dragon Telly, but he wanted the Mirror Telly pickups in it. But Oh, what is this? That is a gorgeous custom especially for a lefty they're saying it's mint the finish doesn't quite look right though it's what year is this one supposed to be 1979 through 80 that would be a perfect teardrop shape so i'm betting this thing has been refinished and the fact that it has a two-piece top is a little bit suspicious but most lefties would be a custom order, so I guess it's possible somebody custom ordered it with a two-piece top. But tops like that just... I'm not going to say they didn't exist. You don't see them looking like that too often. So we'll have to see what the seller has in his description. I mean, the back of the guitar looks all right. Is it Kalamazoo made? Yes, it is. And it's got one of those funky serial numbers. Whenever a serial number looks hand-stamped like that, there's actually a pretty good odds that it is legitimate. And if it's got any kind of quirky, weird specs, I've seen quite a few of them, you know, be okay. So, huh. Since it's a Kalamazoo, I, I might believe it. But what's going on here? We don't have the, the shielding plate? That looks like mid-70s wiring. But the serial number says, I think, the fourth day of 1980, if I'm reading that correctly. Huh. Let's see what they're saying this is. 1980 original vintage left-handed Gibson custom tobacco sunburst. I wish it would have took some photos of the pickups. But he says the dates on the pots are all 1979. That seems to line up with the serial number. Pristine and as close to mint as it gets. Sometimes that can be kind of scary on a guitar that's pretty custom. He's saying a medium neck profile. Okay, some of the Kalamazoo ones are a little bit chunkier. But he doesn't appear to say anything has been reworked. So, huh, that's kind of an interesting one. I wish he would have took photos of the underside of the pickups. Let us look inside the pickup cavities. I mean, it's possible this is legit. There's enough of those features that I've seen before on really strange guitars that would work on this. But there's also some red flags. Like, these knobs are overly aged as compared to the bindings. Normally, you don't find an amber switch tip, so that's likely a replaced part. You can tell that the strap buttons themselves have also been replaced. The gold on the pickups looks much newer than what's on the bridge and tailpiece. That's not always a red flag. Sometimes guys just anchor their hands down here, but it is something to know. The way those strings are wound on there is kind of suspicious as well. <laughs> but I'll leave that for an interested buyer to dive into deeper. Next up, you got kind of a rare grabber reissue base. Unfortunately, all the good stuff's always local pickup only. That's a pretty nice looking vintage Firebird. As far as the Gibson Demo Shop goes this week, uh, not too much fancy was listed. But there was a steal of a deal on one of the brand new 60th Anniversary SG Customs. Brand new, they're $6,700. So the fact that they sold one for $5,300, man, that's, that's crazy cheap. I guess it's because it had some small finish cracks on both sides of the nut. I had somebody ask me, how true to the descriptions are these guitars in the Gibson demo shop? 
if anything, I would actually call them overly picky. And that's coming from a guy that writes some pretty detailed descriptions of my stuff. But I'm kind of surprised that they didn't show us the uh, the nut cracks. Because sometimes those can look pretty ugly. So they must have been pretty bad if they're going to discount it that heavily. That was definitely a steal for somebody on a brand new model. It's a limited edition. I thought this Les Plus was pretty cool looking too with that flame top. But the only one I was really sad about missing this time was the, the SG Naked. One of these times I'm going to get lucky because they keep listing these things. They must have a, a small stockpile of them and they list them at great prices. But that's an old model from 2016. And at 700 bucks, that was a deal. Because people are always asking considerably more. Like, here's one that's been modified. But like all original examples, normally, you know, 850 to 1000 bucks, that's completely fair game. But let's see, they've done one, two, three, four of them. I really wanted that one too. I think that was like two or three weeks ago. They shared it on their Instagram page. And now we move on to some listings that just made me scratch my head. So when this thing first came up, I got kind of excited because it said Gibson Les Paul Custom Studio Custom from 1983, which is the first year. And he's saying it's the first run, collector's grade, very good condition. It looks fantastic in this leading photo. I thought, hey, I finally found like a collector's grade version of this very popular guitar. 3000 bucks. It's high, but people are paying crazy money for these things, and it is a very nice sought after model. And it looks like it's got a whole bunch of case candy on it too. So I'm imagining this thing like being mint condition, right? And then, and then I start going through it. It's like, okay, yeah, that looks good. Something a little bit strange with our poker chip and toggle switch situation. Somebody likely added the TP6 tailpiece after the factory, but hey, it still looks good. It was likely done very early on. This is one of the versions with the nylon saddle three-point adjustment bridge. It's even got our Tim Shaw PAF stickers right here on it. So it's like a complete package here. If only it had the flip out winding tuners. So you keep going, you see all that stuff. And then you go, ah. Refret? That's not collector condition if it has a refret. It makes it a great player because these are great, fantastic playing guitars. And and having the taller frets will definitely make it more comfortable for modern era players. Then you keep going. You see the custom shop edition decal. And then you see the nuts also been replaced. And then you get to this. It's like... <laughs> I know I'm being hypercritical of this guitar, but if you've got a giant section of finish missing off the side of your guitar, I'm sorry, it's no longer collector's grade. But speaking of crazy modifications, <laughs> this 40 years old Firebird, it, I, I just had to share this because this likely started life as two mini humbuckers that somebody has routed out for what looks like EMG pickups. The wiring also had to go for the active electronics and they routed it out for a Kaler. That poor old Firebird. Oh good, he's actually added some photos. This is a 1982. When I first looked at this one last night, it didn't have a serial number photo. You don't find too many early 80s Firebirds out there. I have had a natural one before though. Yep, this angle definitely shows us those are EMG pickups, so that confirms everything. So yeah, just, kind of a strange firebird i wouldn't wouldn't think to active electronic out one of those and give it a whammy bar even that dog is slightly questioning the decisions of this guitar and lastly today we were talking about sgs that get vibrolas added to them this is one of those guitar center exclusive rose gold sgs absolutely beautiful guitars and then somebody put this maestro on it which unfortunately in my opinion they really threw off the entire vibe of this guitar when they did that because they lost the beautiful pairings. So if you haven't watched the full review and demo, Guitar Center has a thing for pink guitars. They like to do rose gold finish and they match chrome with gold. So you've actually got gold screws here. You're gonna notice that the thumb wheels here are gold as well as the posts. You get a chrome bridge right there. You even have it, you know, matching with the knobs going on here as well as the strap buttons, I believe were originally like that. You've got a gold washer with the silver securing nut. This guy took the tuners even a step further. I think I actually talked about this in my review that they should have done golden tips with the body like that. So that was a nice modification. 
But unfortunately, we've we've lost that whole gold chrome combination with this. But I get it. Who really wants to buy two of those units in order to keep doing that? But if you could put like the silver plate on top of that, because you can remove those and swap those out. It's just that screw right there. You got four of them. And then maybe go as far as giving yourself the chrome arm. That, that might match okay. <laughs> but those things are kind of expensive and hard to find just on their own. So, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Remember, change your reverb passwords just in case. And I will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.